Welcome to the Final Straw Radio. I'm Bursa Goodness. In this podcast special, I spoke with Auntie. Auntie is a member of Moscow Anarchist Black Cross, which does anti repression work for anarchists and anti authoritarian anti fascists. Many members of Moscow ABC are now living abroad and doing their work from there due to intense repression by the government of Russia and its client states. From March 11th to 18th, there has been a call out for international solidarity with Russian anarchists and anti-fascists facing repression, and Moscow ABC has specifically called for solidarity on March 18th, which is the first round of elections for the Russian presidency. During this hour, Auntie will speak about the cases of anarchists repressed in Penza, St. Petersburg, Moscow, Crimea, and Sevastopol in particular and elsewhere, as well as the situations of imprisoned Russian anarchists and anti-fascists. For more information on the work of Moscow ABC, organizing and resistance in Russia, check out the website avtonom, which is A-V-T-O-N-O-M dot org slash E-N. To find more episodes of The Final Straw, check out thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, including our prior interview with Auntie where Auntie spoke about earlier repression cases for people, some of whom are currently the anarchist and anti-fascist prisoners that are discussed. If you'd like, you can seek us out on all the dumb social media platforms we inhabit. Uh, mm. You can also make donations to us on our Patreon page if you'd like, or via Stripe or PayPal, to help us increase our reach and the quality of our programming. And for more questions or suggestions, you can email us at thefinalstarradio at riseup.net. Thank you. We're speaking with Antti, a member of Moscow Anarchist Black Cross living abroad, in order to catch up about the call for a week of solidarity with anarchists and anti-fascists in the Russian Federation facing increased repression. Moscow ABC and others have called for days of and a week of solidarity from March 11th to March 18th, uh, in the run-up to the March 18th, Russian presidential elections that have been the cause for an increased clampdown on radicals at the hands of the FSB, formerly the KGB. Thank you very much for joining us, Antti. Yeah, thank you too. <laughs> yeah. Most prominent these days are the cases of the anarchists arrested in Penza and St. Petersburg. To start with Penza, can you talk about the six comrades arrested? Okay, there are all currently six comrades uh, who were arrested in Penza. Actually, five of them uh, were arrested in Penza. And uh, one of them, Arman Zaginbaev, he was taken to from St. Petersburg. Uh, he was arrested in St. Petersburg, but eventually um, sent to Penza to to the remand prison there. And uh, this way, actually, the whole news basically broke only on January. Already the arrested started in the late October and and early November, but the news broke only in uh, on. Uh, January, when people started to get arrested in St. Petersburg, because Penza people were not so much connected connected uh, to other cities, and also the relatives kind of hope that, um, which is pretty often happens in Russia, that um, the defense is basically organized by relatives. And relatives kind of hope that if there is low profile, if it's not much attention, maybe it's better than to make the case much political, which is kind of understandable, but also often it, it can also backfire so it's not necessarily the best strategy but so what came um, kind of then eventually uh, human rights activist and anarchist went to penza on on uh, december and january and uh, the news eventually spread that uh, people were started all the six people yegor zorin Ilya shakursky vasily kuksov mitri pchelnichev and andrei chernov they were, were one by one arrested in penza taken to remand prison and tortured pretty heavily to the extent that eventually actually at, at, after several months of torture it's apparently only Kuksov who is not admitting any level of guilty guiltiness and they are they are uh, and all these arrests they are connected to set up a sort of terrorist organization which uh, FSB the Russian secret services they called as a set which is like network it kind of doesn't mean anything. So, but so this is apparently something kind of uh, which, uh, but apparently FSB couldn't imagine anything better out. And uh, all of this, this is connected to a wider theme of repression, which is, at, in the one hand, it's connected to up upcoming elections in the next uh, 
Sunday there will be a presidential elections when uh, Putin is be Putin is being reelected. He's been already ruling almost 20 years and will be ruling six years more. So, and it's kind of uh, expected that always before the elections there is kind of fear mongering, some sort of terrorist conspiracies and uh, to make people more fear more afraid but of course with the terrorism it's a problem that if there is a terrorist attack it's always also discredits the um, the secret services though it's the most convenient thing is to find out the terrorist organization which actually never made any attacks and never even existed and just to, to get arrest people so this is kind of old scene which been happening already for more than 20 years but uh, what's kind of new in this is that the level of torture and repression is kind of unprecedented. It's not uh, unprecedented in the, some Russian areas like Northern Caucasus, which is basically has been a Stalinist regime already for 15 years in Dagestan and Chechnya. But this kind of of system when you just arrest people and then torture them until they confess and then you arrest their contacts and, and, and then torture them in this kind of chain reaction, this is... Um, something that doesn't have been happen in relation to anti and anarchist and of course there is uh, existing there is an insurrectionally anarchist tendency also in russia like in many places and we know that people are and, and people are doing attacks and this kind of thing so it's not you cannot always i mean it's not relevant from anarchist point of view it's not a relevant question if people are so guilty or not in from point of view of the bourgeois system but in this case it's obviously that it's also people being arrested who doesn't have much of any connections. Connection like Ilya Kapustin inside Petersburg is not much connected to any movement. It was pretty much random arrest and torture. They managed to try to catch him anyway. And also one, one thing it's, it's connected. There used to be a sort of underground far right movement on a, it's, it's around this populist Polish and Vladislav Malchev, who is it's kind of right wing uh, politician. He was in different political parties lately in, in Paranas, which is a liberal party and, uh, and in the um, statewide elections. But he already since around uh, five years, he's been promising that there will be revolution in Russia and it was supposed to happen for 4th of November. And he also had the YouTube channel, which eventually because he had this kind of ap apocalyptic uh, declaration, it got pretty popular and he had some following. And apparently there were also people doing attacks around November. There was at least one Polish, there was also an attack against police station in Moscow and this kind of quite a small scale thing. But eventually more than 300 people were arrested all around the Russia, accused of being part of this conspiracy. But many of these people didn't have any connections. Like there were some people studying um, liberal philosophy in Moscow got arrested and some people who want independence in Petersburg to kind of St. Petersburg separatists, they got arrested in St. Petersburg. So it was lots of random people who also got arrested and apparent and, and probably depends on people, like most likely they also don't have much of connection to this. So it's kind of general fear mongering. I doubt that there is like underground terrorists uh, everywhere. And it's not only people in Pensa and St. Petersburg arrested, it's also been in Chelyabinsk, in Moscow. There has been searches in Omsk in Siberia. So Generally, it looks more and more like 30s, like when there is, uh, uh, when there were definitely the diverse armored uh, anti resistance against Stalin in the 30s, but uh, like 99% of the people who were arrested and executed for terrorism in the 30s, they, uh, they were not involved in any kind of armored resistance or, or espionage or anything. So, could it be argued that, that the the reason that the FSB and the security forces are going down this route and trying to and accusing people and torturing people for so-called terrorism is because they're trying to stop social movements from organizing in the first place by imposing a regime of terror. Well, it's kind of yes, it's kind of uh, this is what is happening, but um, but it's also like uh, I don't think that there is currently any clear visible threat. Of, of the Putin's, it was uh, somehow, there was a wave of, of protest against two, in 2011 and 2012, and there were, there were still like um, quite large scale movements, like the movement of, um, of um, truck drivers against the new, new taxing system of the truck drivers. So there are, are like social movements, but I don't think that there is a, any 
real threat against the system. So, I mean, there are different opinions on that. Some people are more more optimistic, also among the anarchists. And also the system, of, obviously, is not like super stable, so it can start to collapse at, uh, at any time. But basically, this is one thing which is happening is this um, called, it's already like also a long time uh, tradition in, in Russia. It's called Krugove Baruka, which is kind of a collective responsibility. And... Um, in terms of, and also like it's a productivity thing that uh, in the secret services they have to do a certain amount of arrests. They have to find a certain amount of terrorists <coughs> in order to proceed in their careers. If they don't arrest anything, they will get fired. And this is kind of like quantitative uh, performance. This was pretty usual in the Stalinist times, but it's still in Russia. That you have to, if you are working the police force, if you work in the secret services, you have to have results and it's kind of um, and you often like this kind of thinking you often connect with the capitalist reality that uh, with that it's like quantifical uh, parameters of healthcare or or school system it's 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 very like everyone knows that this kind of thing simply don't work out and pro- probably it's just a corruption or something else but actually it's is very well like this whole idea of competition and whole idea of quanti like quantifying the results of your work it's, it's pretty common was in stalinist and soviet system and it's still existing in the police force and the fsb and apparently it's just currently fsb has figured out that nothing happens to them they can torture people they can frame up people and um, there is simply no any mechanism to stop them so it's kind of a system which is out of control and no one is really interested to stop unless there is um, some uh, movement against this. Because one thing is that there has been like plenty of quite radical and successful social movements in Russia during the last 25 years, but uh, usually anti-repression movements haven't been much successful. So this is basically what's happening now in this respect. Like this is kind of result of many years of failures of anti-repression movements that the FSB and the secret services, they feel that um, they are un- unpunishable. They can do anything. But And also what's happening is it's, it's like kind of, um, I don't know if maybe in, in the in the USA people don't maybe know what's, what's the city of Pensa, but um, it's a small like peripheral city in the east from Moscow. But the thing is that it's always has been much more repression in the smaller cities. Like the freest places in, in Russia for the last 20 years, it has been Moscow and St. Petersburg. There are some provincial cities which are exceptional, like Perm, which has, and, and Karelia, the Petrozavodsk. But basically, these kind of smaller cities, usually it's impossible to maintain anarchist activity for more than two years. At this point, you get repressed, you have to move out or you go to jail. So the, and what happened in and in these kind of smaller cities, the authorities, the FSB and the, the anti-extremist police, which is a separate force, they feel that uh, in the one hand they don't have so much there is so obviously no any terrorist in Penza and uh, never there has never been, but there is still anti-extremist police and there is FSB. There are both of the structures. They had to do something, so they frame things up and arrest some uh, people who just happen to be there and happen to be suitable targets. And uh, in the provincial places, they feel that they can do anything. And then when there is already a case, it spreads to bigger cities like St. Petersburg. So a lot of what you're describing with, just to stick on this topic, but um, a lot of what you're describing in terms of the um, anti-extremist police and the FSB and the way that they interact with potential threats to hegemony in the Russian state and to Putin's reign, uh, you could say similar things to the longstanding, no matter what the administration is running of the FBI, for instance, in the United States. And definitely yeah. like a more repressive situations occur in rural areas where there's less oversight, where the media is less present and less willing or able to actually shed light on situations and build up popular disgust against circumstances. But I'd, I'd like to like just just to hear your thoughts about like while the FBI frames up situations uh with supposed terrorist plots in order to shore up its role and its funding year by year. They say, oh, we stopped this many plots and put this many people in jail, when in fact, in many cases, they're setting up uh, marginalized people from immigrant communities who maybe have mental health issues um, and, like, handing weapons to them or pretend weapons to them so that they could be charged with terrorism so the FBI can look like they're stopping something. 
Uh, no. It sounds like it's far more widespread and regularized practice in the Russian Federation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's yeah, it's a similar pattern. I actually didn't thought about this before, but this was obviously I was following the Cleveland case. Yeah, and it was uh, obvious uh, provocation. I haven't been following so much then, but of course, like FBA and um, is, is is still uh, slightly more uh, clever in this because they at least uh, try to infiltrate and do this kind of thing. But in Russia, it's basically they just. Uh, pick people up and give them electric shocks and, and so on. So it's kind of primitive. It's it's more brutal and more primitive, but it's it's basically it's the same phenomena. Yeah, I would agree with this. Two other anarchist comrades were arrested in St. Petersburg and faced similar circumstances to those in Penza at the hands of the FSB. Victor Filinkov and Igor Shishkin were arrested and Ilya Kapustin is listed as a witness. Would you talk about their situation? Yeah, it was basically, um, they got arrested in, in late uh, January, and um, I guess around 27th and 28th, and actually Kapustin kind of uh, just randomly, Kapustin got randomly uh, arrested because he was in a uh, phone connected, um, I guess, to Filinko, but I may don't remember the exact details, but he was just having some... Uh, some basically work related and business related issues but because he was calling to them he got uh, also arrested and tortured and what happened with them basically like um, in the time of arrest they were taken to forest and beaten there and given electric shocks and uh, only after several hours like four or five hours they were taken to fsb station and uh, and then um, then um, and it was basically written that they were arrested like five five hours later than they were actually arrested, even though it was the same police. And also, what happened with actually with Filinkov that they actually took him first to hospital to have a complex um, like uh, all this analysis, like he heard how because just to kind of scientifically establish how much he would basically take torture. Because basically, for if he had a heart problems, for example, they couldn't have been given electric shocks, or, but uh, to do something else instead. So it was basically like pretty cynical and planned uh, thing. And even after this, like in the in the torture, from time to time, it has also been continuing in, in the detention. But they are in the better situation because they are in the biggest city. They are in the better connected with the anarchist movement, with the human rights activists. Even they got pretty soon because the pencil lawyers. Pencil lawyers are basically paid by the relatives. They have been pretty quite passive and also not wanting to go public. But uh, Filinkov and Shishkin lawyers, they are they have been working uh, with uh, with the media and with the journalists. Currently, of, unfortunately, it seems like Shishkin's will has been broken. He he took back all these complaints about the police abuse. So he's basically just uh, kind of how to give up the resistance, which is kind of understandable. If if uh, probably like ninety nine percent of the, of the people give up sooner or later if 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 you are tortured enough, but Filinkov is still um, still giving testimony about the torture and and connected with the media. Kapustin actually came uh, to media today. He is uh, now escaped to Finland, so he's out of the harm's way. So this was not public information before, but he gave an interview which was published today. So he's basically fine. That's awesome. Fine, yeah. He managed to to get out from the country, but the other people are still being detained. Detained, but uh, in Saint Petersburg, it's Saint Petersburg. It has been a slightly, slightly better situation, but obviously, still the um, the FSB is not a f- kind of. Um, it's still possible that the torture practice is is being continued. Continued because I don't think that FSB is really feeling. Uh, any heat on this at this point. <clears throat> so you had mentioned before the the large events or the large repressions that happened in 2011 and 2012. Uh, the Russian elections happen every six years. Can you talk about the elections this year? Um, would you say these are fair and free elections? And what happens to opposition to Putin or, or uh, the running of elections as they stand in Russia? So this um, actually it's, it's only presidential election, which is six years, and this was also reformed by Putin. They used to be each four years, 
the Duma, the, the parliamentary, national parliamentary elections, they are each four years. And then there is uh, obvious municipal elections. And in Moscow, there is also one level before below the municipality. But anyway, the most important, uh, like national, is, is is the national elections. The parliamentary election was 2015, and uh, and the presidential election is now. And uh, probably people kind of Russia is kind of presidential system. Uh, the um, president has lots of uh, executive power, so it's 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 important. But it's also there is not really like independent candidates. Candidates. Uh, the only main like parties which are currently in Duma, they are more or less um, loyal parties. They don't uh, question the Putin's authority. So last time it was kind of um, most kind of like Putin got officially sixty five percent of the votes, but they were assessment of electionary fraud, which was taken by statistical means. They were like statistical anomalies. So, which I think, I mean, of course, it's a discussion, like how much you can prove, there, how much you can make a conclusion from these anomalies. But I guess the amount of fraud was maybe 15%. But obviously, the main thing is not that all the media is, there is no, like, for example, an independent nationwide television in Russia. And all this... National wide television, it does its best to, to to discredit opposition, like other candidates. It's not even oppositional because it's these are not like uh, much opposition. There has to be some candidates in order to be a competition. Like always, if there is election in 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 northern, like not necessarily in North Korea, but in China, for example, there are these official opposition parties. But everyone knows that um, not, that they play no any role whatsoever. So it's the same in Russia. The main kind of oppositional guy is is, is Alexei Navalny. He's kind of um, right wing liberal nationalist. So, but he was barred from the election because he has this framed up uh, criminal sentence for which his brother was sent to jail. So he's calling for a boycott of the elections. But basically, um, yeah, I would like everyone basically know what will be the result of the election. Putin will be reelected. In the first round, there would be a second round, because otherwise, if 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 he wouldn't get the fifty percent of the votes, there would be a second round with the two most uh, popular candidates. But this won't happen. Like I would be surprised for other candidates to gain even even twenty percent altogether. Like Communist Party got some uh, rich businessman to be their candidates, and this kind of <laughs> like it's kind of ridiculous in the way yeah it's kind of ridiculous in the way which is uh, how it's going on like probably i don't know many people who in who are now in russia who are going to who who are are going to vote yeah but yeah they're not not not, not much but even though the, like um, even though like the there will be nothing much interesting happening in the elections it's still this um, like there are still these pressures, and Putin actually himself was making a speech lately against illegal demonstration. It can be whatever. Like illegal demonstration is just any demonstration. Not it's not uh, uh, like no, no illegal demonstration is any demonstration which has not been agreed with the police before. So, so it can be just that you are marching and having uh, flags and banners and whatever and shouting something. But according to Putin, this is a threat which has to be stopped. So one of the reasons why there were arrests in, in Moscow and in Chelyabinsk, it's also that Putin personally said that the uh, illegal demonstration are a menace, which, which has to be stopped. But obviously, like nowadays, you cannot have permission to any demonstration. Like only exception is this called one person picket when there is only one person at a time. So this is kind of the only thing that doesn't need the official permission. So pretty much the opposition is, uh, this is pretty much the only tactics which is uh, available of the opposition unless you want to risk arrests and, and big fines. This may be an, this may be an annoying question. Yeah. But, uh, so there's a lot of fixation in the United States yeah. right now about uh, official like Russian government influence in the U.S. elections of last year and lots of back and forth. And the, the politicians, especially Trump, I think are just playing off of the idea of oh yeah there was outside influence but you know we won anyway or yeah we got to like ramp up our nationalism because we're afraid of these outside agitators or influence coming in uh it's and it's in my opinion it's it's pretty farcical these governments try to interfere with each other's elections mm -hmm. all the time and it shouldn't come as a surprise but it also doesn't mean that yeah it it doesn't it's an easy target or an easy out especially 
especially when there's a history of a Cold War between the U.S. and Russia, for instance. Do you see anything on your side? Like in, in Russia, is this a thing that's brought up that um, the demonstrations in the street might be a reflection of some sort of attempt at a, an orange revolution or some other U.S. or international capitalist attempt to undermine the sovereignty of Russia? Well, I, I think it's um, like this is like less bit less relevant topic in terms of Russia than, for example, with Ukraine. But I think in general, uh, in, in, in general, I mean, obviously, um, like what is a, like official Russian propaganda is that the Russia is under threat. There is enemies everywhere. Russia has no any friends. Like China is a danger, and Japan and Europe, European Union, and liberalism and rights of uh, like sexual minorities and family is being destroyed, and the uh, United States is being attacking us, and, and so on. So this is obviously this is a Russian discourse. But what I have seen, like I've been in, I was in September in Ukraine, and also in Russia, it's always this kind of movements. They start from below. Obviously, like um, kind of. Um, United States and European Union, because this, for at times, this is uh, image of um, something different and something liberal and some things which are better organized and so on. And also, like in Russian opposition, I met uh, I never met so many people who are completely uncritical of the United States as I have met in the Russian opposition. And this is not like a majority of the opposition, but there is a good part of the people who basically, like there are people also in the in the Russian opposition who think that United States is a paradise. So this kind of thing exists, but basically like always kind of demonstrations and orange revolutions, they always first, and Arab Spring, they always first of all a local phenomena based on the local problems and conflicts. Conflicts and... Uh, it's never just something that can be decided somewhere in Washington or Freedom House or CIA or whatever. Like these people can maybe influence to some extent, but it's never, uh, I, I don't believe that it's a necessary factor. Factor and um, so on. It's, it's in the terms of the um, anarchism, it's also like, like in, especially with the, with the Black Cross work. We always had also a problem that um, it was pretty hard to have a kind of constant, um, like what was basically Moscow anarchist Black Cross, like now like half of the members have been, are now been, have to been forced to get out of Russia. Russia, but um, basically what was basically Moscow anarchist Black Cross doing was fundraising. But most of the fundraising always happened from abroad. So it was also for us a problem that we were kind of dependent on international framework in a way it's good like we are anarchists we don't care about the anarchist bo like national borders but also it, it's a, something which makes us vulnerable because of course at some point um, russian authorities may yeah. may destroy all the channels to, to abroad so you should have also a local base also like infrastructure financial base and so on but i don't know we are kind of running the race against the time because uh, because the repression is growing much more faster than we have been managed to create any anarchist infrastructure in Russia. So I don't know what will happen on this. Like basically, basically right now I would say that we are like, uh, how to say, losing the struggle, but uh, it can, uh, obviously things can change pretty quickly and, and things may get better at any point, but we will see. So to get back to the, um, more. Let's get back to more cases of repression. But but there are there are other yeah. things that that um, had come up that were brought up in the this article in Aftonom that was very informative. Um, another circumstance that ABC talks about or that Moscow Anarchist Black Cross talks about is the arrest of Elena Gorban and Alexei Kabiaje in Moscow in late January. Uh, I guess I guess in connection with the attempted arson of an office of Putin's political party, the United Russia. Russia party, yeah. or this is the accusation that the state is making. Uh, what happened to Elena and Alexei, and where are they now? Uh, yeah, actually, the article on Autonomy and Original was written in Russian, but it was actually translated by Freedom, people from the UK. So thanks for the Freedom people, in case they are listening to this, for, for translating the thing. And um, this, uh, Moscow people, they were arrested after Solidarity Action, which was illegal demonstration. 
and they were also accused of the sabotage, but they were eventually released, released uh, pending the court. So they are now now out from the prison, but obviously the court is coming and, and they might be in problem uh, sometime soon. So in terms of, of them, there is no like urgent uh, problems, but uh, I have to follow up with, with the accusations. And, but yeah, but they, they, they are currently not detained. In Chelyabinsk, a symbolic solidarity action was conducted for the folks in Penza. This led to the detention of five activists. Uh, what can you say about them and their condition? Yeah, this is pretty uh, also something pretty new, but, but because the Pensa action, it was not like anything super radical. They basically had a banner, which was like FSB is the main terrorist, and they hanged it to the FSB building. And, uh, and they didn't got arrested as far as I know on the spot, but FSB tracked them down. Which is maybe not so super difficult because it's not so many people active there. It's like Chelyabinsk is, is a big city in the Ural area, but it's not uh, that there are like many anarchists there. So basically, FSB tracked them down and took them and uh, arrested them and tortured them in, and uh, in order to have them confess. And they are now ac- accused of this crime called hooliganism which is a pretty strange, um, it's also a Soviet invention that if, if there is a crime which doesn't basically have any victim, but it's kind of antisocial behavior or something, it's hooliganism. So it can be pretty much whatever the authorities don't like, but uh, there is uh, like pretty good, uh, you can have uh, several years of prison sentence from this. So it's a pretty, pretty um, difficult situation. This is the same law according to which Pussy Riot was also sentenced. But this is also something that never happened, that people were just just putting up a banner and uh, were put to prison on this. So it's kind of um, characteristic that things are getting worse in Russia in this respect. And, and basically all the space to have actions is, is, is being cut down. And it's very little things you can actually do, like in the public anymore. anymore. There was a, like also there was a football, anti-fascist football tournament in, in Moscow one week ago. Where a police came, but uh, and uh, checked everybody's IDs. But this time they didn't arrest people because the same, and they, they didn't stop the tournament. What happened in autumn? So even like this kind of thing that you gather somewhere and just to play football, it's too much for the like soccer. I mean, I guess in the U.S. football is another thing. So these people were paying, playing European football, and they got uh, checked by the police. So even this is something is which is not possible to do anymore in Russia, at least without harassment. And it seems like it's it's outside of the Russian borders proper, too. In the last year's repression at the hands of the Russian government of activists in the reoccupied region of Ukraine called Crimea has also been a thing. Can you talk about Yevgeny and um, how he fares? Yeah, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, Kar- Kar- Karakashev, yeah, this was... Um, yeah, Yevgeny, Yevgeny Karakashev, yeah, there were uh, several people arrested. This was actually new people arrested... Um, arrested uh, just a few days ago. Yeah, Shostakovich and Marko, they were arrested at least for 10 days in Crimea, in Sevastopol. Yeah, Shostakovich was arrested on the 2nd of March. So it's it was earlier, uh, like last weekend also. Also, so they are basically, Karakashev is, is arrested of of posting a so-called extremist call in the contact, which is like Russian version of the Facebook. And apparently the new people arrested, they are somehow connected to, to this case. It could be that the authorities are wanting to frame up extremist organization. Not um, all of, like this are, uh, like Karakashev is, is, uh, is uh, from, is anarchist, but other people arrested, uh, they are, um, I guess in some general leftist framework, they are all a network in the Crimea. And Crimea, uh, basically, it's also amount of repression has been pretty high after the annexation. Mostly, mostly the Crimean Tatars are being uh, targeted because it's a kind of uh, ethnical minority group, which is um, pretty much how to say, completely against occupation and, and pro-Ukrainian. It has a tradition of uh, of being target of heavy repression and ethnic cleansing in the Soviet time. So they are pretty heavily, but it's also kind of compact and and uh, 
how to say they have strong sense of solidarity and strong sense of community so they are being heavily repressed around 10 of them have been disappeared and some of them have been found dead but some of the disappeared people have never been found i mean there are there and some of them have been died in the strange circumstances so it's mostly repression is against Kimya Tatars, but also against uh, other people which are uh, suspected um, non-loyal to the new new system and new re regime and this includes um, movie director Oleg Sentsov who was um, sentenced for 20 years of uh, accused of organized armed group against uh, occupation and also Alexander Kolchenko who was uh, imprisoned for 10 years with the same case so and now it's apparently like new wave of repression since stream uh, probably the attempts is just to get rid of the anarchists altogether. All this, this, all of these people, they have been involved in some local social movements with uh, bread and butter kind of of issues. Issues. Uh, so it's also kind of um, the authorities want to make uh, things even by by arresting them. But it's also like posting something to Russian Facebook. It's also something you can accuse anyone. Basically, like it's pretty convenient way to rep of, of repression, and it nowadays happens pretty often that people are arrested and accused of, of writing something or, or sharing something. Just by um, sharing some link, you can basically get a prison sentence. So it's uh, quite convenient for the author authorities. It's 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 uh, this far it doesn't has it, it the case has not been connected with um, with the Saint Petersburg or Pensa case. But it's possible that they want to make make the, at some point they want to claim that this is all one big uh, terrorist organization. We will see. <clears throat> um, yeah. So I know in the United States, among radicals and anarchists and anti-fascists, it's been a constant struggle to attempt to get, especially new people that are getting involved in activism, to not not use social media because it's such because it's infiltrated by police because the companies that run it in the United States case are very happy to hand over information uh, to authorities because it's insecure and it's a bad security practice. People continue to do it and people do end up facing charges for things that they say. Um, and it's also a useful tool for activists on the left, anti-fascists and anarchists, to find out information about public officials who do the same thing and post things on the internet or or fascists who organize over the internet. It's, it's an easy way to keep track of them. Um, has there been much push among radicals in Russia that you're aware of against the use of social media as a practice? Well, well, like obviously it's um, it's like ongoing discussion, but one of the things is that it's actually been uh, more safe to, to be in the social media than to be in, in any other place. Like to be socially in the real life, it's actually been, especially in the current situation, it's more dangerous. Like you cannot really, you cannot organize public events in most of the cities. In Moscow, there is maybe one place you, where you can still do this without police coming. But in most of the cases, most of the places, not then you cannot have demonstrations and talks. But still, uh, in many many social media, it's still uh, possible to do and. Uh, now, lately, actually, people have been moving and in contact with most of the groups. Uh, like, there has occasionally groups have been closed, but it's still many anarchist groups still, uh, and, and the pages are still existing in contact. It's, of course, maybe because the cops just want to monitor what people are talking and doing, so you cannot, but still, like, this is, it's possible to discuss there, but it's not necessarily possible to discuss offline. Unless uh, you are like a super high conspiracy level, now much of the things, many things have been moved mm -hmm. to Telegram. Tele Telegram, because it's it's uh, even it's a bit uh, slightly more difficult for authorities to control Telegram, and there are uh, you can have also this uh, kind of channel in Telegram, and people might subscribe it, and this is pretty yeah. popular lately. There is, but there has also been like a police has been able to close, like FSB has managed to close some of the channels in Telegram. So apparently there are some weaknesses in the Telegram infrastructure. We don't exactly know which, but it's not like a foolproof. But it's uh, get it's being more uh, obviously it's being more safe than uh, than contact, for example. And also, but and and as far as I know, the uh, police. The, 
the FSB doesn't really have so much hold in the like foreign uh, social media like Facebook and Twitter. I mean, they of course can monitor things, but uh, I don't know like lots of cases when they have managed to have this court in injunction, which f Facebook has fulfilled. This maybe in, in some anti-terrorist cases could be possible, but um, kind of it's a bit different if you are not in the US to use uh, social media, which is yeah. American based. Because obviously FBI, for FBI, it's probably quite easy to get whatever information there. But from the Russian secret services, at least, I, I don't know the cases when, uh, for example, a Russian FSB has managed to break uh, Facebook discussions or closed Facebook group and use this as a, like with the uh, help of the Facebook. And of course, you cannot trust them, but still people kind of, um, the trade-offs are a bit uh, different outside the United States. But anyway, like this is of this is of course like ongoing discussion, and I don't, I can't say anything much final. I mean, I just see the trends, but where the things are going, it's pretty hard to say. I mean, maybe maybe Telegram is being replaced by something else. I don't know. At least obviously, I I recently saw some statistics that the amount of Tor users, like TOL users, is highest in Russia in the whole whole world. So apparently. The authorities closing websites and banning websites. It's increasing uh, awareness of the Tor usage. But in other hand, also I've, I've read articles about Tor being broken and having vulnerabilities. So we don't know. Like it's kind of, but this is kind of race against the time. Like uh, authorities are doing one things and and uh, people are doing another thing. So I don't know where the things are eventually going to lead. Like, but I, I wouldn't say that it's just a kind of. Um, dystopian reality coming true altogether it's just um, just that the, some things are getting worse and some are getting better yeah and not to not to totally poo poo people's participation in social media like in yeah. uh, i just spoke with an organizer an anarcho syndicalist who was organizing in west virginia and the way that they were able to get uh, teachers involved in the movement was creating secret facebook groups that eventually somebody invited the wrong union official into but this this autonomous union was the one of the forces that was pushing for the wildcat strike that shut down the school system for almost 12 days in the state of west virginia it things can get done on that platform and levels of repression aren't necessarily comparable between uh being an anti-state radical facing off against the fsb versus you know in the united states of a, a teacher trying to organize um a strike but yeah, I, your your point is taken, and I don't mean to to assume that people in Russia aren't thinking about mm. the implications of these things. Yeah, yeah, and also like I mean, it's obvious. Like one other thing, which is pretty obvious, with the current uh, things which are happening in Russia, that in my like this is of course I'm talking as a personal opinion and not not, not as a position of an accused Black Cross of Moscow or anything else. But you have to get involved in the social movement somehow. Because uh, isolated anarchist moment it is just getting destroyed, and right now, like how I see it, uh, is uh, kind of um, the Russian authorities are trying to finish off with the anarchist movement as a whole, like and and also the fascist movement, at least as we know it. And this might this could be even and because like of course we see like now it's all together how many it's I think. It, nine or ten people who are arrested but much more have are underground much more people are hiding much more people are abroad so all and it's not such a big moment in the first place so this damage of this is huge and i don't think there is any way you can avoid in this besides being a part of massive social movements because uh, just isolated anarchist movement it will be destroyed i mean to me it's obvious and uh, you can you have to use any any means you can reach out even if it's risky well so yeah right now we're talking on the 10th of march at least in the us and there's a call out that moscow abc and i think other groups have been involved in for international solidarity for russian anarchists and anti-fascists can you talk about that and about how people on the outside can offer support to comrades both monetarily and in terms of solidarity actions? 
Yeah, so like many actions have been already done around Russia and also abroad, I guess, especially in the East Europe, in Poland, in Czech Republic, and also in, I guess, in, in Berlin. Uh, many more, 18th of March, yeah, this is a call by Moscow and Akis Black Ross and, and many other people who are involved in the solidarity campaign. It's it's also the election day, so it's a kind of convenient, it's a Sunday, but it's embassies will be open, the Russian consulate, obviously. Most of the American cities don't have any Russian embassy or consulate, but uh, all the bigger cities, the consulate is available. They will be they will be open. People will be going, so it's also a possibility to discuss with Russian diaspora in different cities. But you don't have to do. You can also target some Russian businesses, like Russian. Uh, basically, monetary interests. It's it's in many places, uh, uh, like uh, basically like big part of the oil. Uh, Globally, not necessary actually in the United States, but in case of European oil, isn't it like most of the gas and oil in, in Europe is is coming from Russia? So it's the Russian in kind of it's it shouldn't be so. The, and Isle of Isle of Isle of Float is a big uh, airplane company, so there is like a Russian different financial interests you can target or or. Um, or just uh, any other kind, whatever is is a common spot in in your city. You you can have action on this. So this will be kind of. I'm pretty sure that this will raise the morale because obviously when you are in prison, when you are arrested, the main problem is the feeling of the isolation. In terms of the financial thing, like this is uh, and the fundraising, this is of of course um, like the biggest. Uh, ever a challenge for us because the lawyers like not all the lawyers are willing to take anti-terrorist case and there is lots of work for the lawyers so they have to work um, sometimes almost full time on this so all the co all together we counted that, that at, for one year of of legal cost we need at least one million rubles which is around 20 or twenty five thousand uh, dollars but actually also at moscow abc we have been uh, able to raise more than eight thousand dollars so already like almost one half of this amount amount to do to like international solidarity so it, things are not so bad in this respect but um and also it's, it's possible that not all of this money is needed because the relatives are also paying parts and uh, and so on but the financial situation is not like catastrophical, but still much more fundraising is, 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 is necessary. So these are the two things to do to spread information. It's hard to say, like, of course, uh, it would be good to have some general discussion, like what to do in the general uh, level of, I mean, to maybe organize boycott, like the Russian situation, not only the anti-fascist and anarchist, but the general. Because the authoritarian development is obviously pretty, um, is, is going on. It's, it's been going on like almost 20 years, but this, what has been happening in the last year and this year, it's, it's, it's much worse than anything before, especially in respect to anti-fascist and anarchist movement. So we should discuss in general what to do. In, like I'm now staying and some of the other comrades from um, Moscow ABC, we are now staying in Finland and we try to organize here some, uh, like also awareness raising events, but obviously in Finland um, there is a bigger interest in the society and the Russian situation because it's the, um, one of the most important trading partners and, and so on. So here it's, it's more connected. So in the United States it's maybe a um, bit uh, more far, but also on the other hand, I guess one of the things what, what has been happening in the United States is the anti-fascist movement has been raised and uh, lots of the... Um, so basically kind of the realities are a bit more similar to European things because especially in Russia in the last decade, but uh, so to some extent also recently, the anti-fascist thing has been quite actual. So in uh, general, it's maybe more interest to anti-fascism all around the world in the United States. So and this uh, is uh, kind of one thing what Russian uh, experience could be relevant. Like it's still... Uh, Still, and I'm. It's, this is something I will maybe be working in the last uh, next one or two years. I try to translate uh, like some Russian anti-anti-fascist, uh, maybe compile something about the history of the anti-fascism in Russia and so on. So this could be some kind of how to say connection, which is not uh, which is not simply fundraising, but also maybe some some general international discussion and so on. 
but we will see how that will work out. I mean, interestingly, in terms of in terms of interconnectedness between anti-fascist struggles in, in multiple countries, like I think that the nationalist push in the United States yeah. against Russia does nothing but to undermine anti-fascist organizing and strengthen the the nationalist position, and so also in Russia, the recent developments and the fact that there's no anti-nationalist position that's at least in the mainstream available. It's either you have this liberal nationalist far-right person or Putin, and they're both calling for this closed-off Russian society with this essentialist identity. And also, even in, in the West, American fascists have been influenced in recent years by Alexander Dugin's writings. And Dugin has, has had relationships with the Putin regime and has also been, as I said, an influence on a lot of third positionists in the United States. So it's, it would, I'm sure any information that you could provide, you know, to the West and insights into how you've kind of organized would be very helpful. Yeah, yeah, it's obviously this is and also not only Dugin, but all this, um, also different left-right synthesis is kind of... Um, it's of course it started from the France in the sixties, all this uh, new right uh, like Ebola and so on. But in the Russia, it was pretty developed. And and Dugin is basically he was one used to be one of the ideologists of the National Bolshevik Party. So it's also this kind of coupling of the left wing, and also in terms of um, kind of things yeah. connected to national anarchism and this kind of uh, strange kind of synthesis. It's been pretty much happening. It, it's also big in Germany. But it's also been big in Ukraine and in Russia, and there is kind of plenty of different tendencies which um, are uh, are problematic in the different ways. And something like, and often like, especially, and one thing is that Russian society and uh, American society they are a bit more similar in some respects than the Russia is to Europe, because uh, because like both U.S. and uh, and uh, Russia, they are kind of imperial entities without clear nationalist thing. Like, of course, they try to construct this, but it doesn't really so much happen because basically both Russia and uh, and um, United States is not ethnically homogeneous. So this is one thing why the, some phenomena are more similar between Russia and, and United States than, for example, between Russia and Germany. So, yeah, so this is one thing and also... Like many things, actually, which uh, and often, especially in Europe, but there is this idea that Europe is is kind of in the front uh, of the history, and Russia is, and all the rest of the world is 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 kind of coming behind. But actually, I think many many things, uh, innovations, they first come to Russia, and then they are getting or some other kind of how to say countries which are in the way. Uh, Peripheric in terms of capitalism, but where some new innovations comes. For example, this whole idea of um, of how to say quanti like uh, quantitative uh, how to say criteria of uh, in, inside different uh, official structures like at the police or healthcare or school system and the competi mm -hmm. competition between inside them and this kind of thing, it's much more developed uh, actually mm -hmm. in Russia than it's in Europe. So this is kind of, uh, in the, some terms, Russia is sort of neoliberal laboratory. It was especially in the 90s, but it's still, this, still the case. But also it's a laboratory of reaction against neoliberalism because actually Putin, uh, of course, the practice is quite neoliberal, but in terms of rhetorics, he is kind of opposite of the neoliberalism. It's like strong social state, uh, giving back the good things from the Soviet Union. So this is also kind of dystopian alternative, what can be the alternative of, I guess, neoliberalism. Because obviously, like, Trump is also, in the in some respects, in the rhetorical level, it's like anti-neoliberal guy. So this is something that's already, like, 15 years been in Russia. And, and, and Putin can be kind of the worst case scenario or what, what Trump may eventually be. I mean, obviously, the Trumpism is is probably going to fade away, but uh, we can only hope. never know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, whatever comes to replace him is not necessarily anything better, but but yeah, anyway, true. Um, yeah. well, Auntie, are there any places that uh, listeners outside of listeners who don't read Russian can specifically look for news about uh, anarchist, Moscow Anarchist Black Cross or about? 
um, the situation in the Russian Federation? We are currently, like I'm involved in the Autonom Org. It's Autonom is old anarchist paper. It's already since the mid-90s. And we have a website. We try to, there is an English, English section of the webpage. We try to gather all the news there. Also, one thing which I could recommend, which is uh, heavily under, how to say, undervalued, it's the Russian Reader blog. You just probably you can find it by the Google by Russian Reader. You can also check the address. It's not especially anarchist resource, but it's a left wing resource. It's being by American expat, and this is why the qual it's American ex expat in Saint Petersburg, and this is why it's actually um, the quality of the um, English is is good because he's a professional translator. So it's russianreader.therussianreader.com. This is a very good page. Um, and it's also relevant in terms of anarchist and anti-fascist news. And then there is uh, also the same guy who is making Russian Reader. He's now providing translations to OVD Info, which is like human rights organization, uh, which is concentrating on police uh, violence. So I try to check. So the site is ovdinfo.org, but apparently there is no clear link to English section for some reason in the front page. So it's pretty bad design. But this is one, yeah, open democracy. It's in the open democracy site. They have a section about ovdinfo. It's opendemocracy.net. But uh, and they have, uh, but there is like general anti, this is like anti liberal, anti repression side, but actually many anarchists are working on this thing. And actually, one of the tendencies in Russia is that uh, many anarchists go to work in human rights organization and many organization because there is not much uh, more you can do in the current realities. And uh, and obviously, the um, anti repression is, is something you cannot really avoid being active in Russia. You, you just have to get involved somehow. So, this is is basically much of the anarchist movement is basically uh, busy just in the anti-repression work. Yeah. Well, Auntie, thank you so much for taking this time and explaining the situation. And I, I wish you luck and solidarity and hope, yeah. you get, hope we get to talk again soon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope, <laughs> hope we don't have a reason to talk together too soon, but anyway, <laughs> thanks for your help. So, uh, Ciao. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, take care.